Over the past few years, my husband and I have traded a lot of homemade gifts for things like Christmas and our birthdays. Like last year, he made me a little miniature diorama of my favorite Rogue One characters. He also made this cute cross stitch of all of the characters that I had cosplayed up until that point, which was super cool. And then last year in 2021, he ended up printing out a little miniature of one of my original characters named Malenti and painted it up for me. And I was starting to feel a little bit guilty about not making him something handmade this year. And then I remembered I made him an entire Mandalorian suit. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Vault Fox. Welcome back to my channel where today I will finally be showing you how I finished up that Mandalorian helmet over there. But before I get on to that, I do have a little bit of an exciting announcement that I want to share with you guys. I launched a Patreon. I have been thinking about launching a Patreon for what feels like the better part of a year. For those of you that don't know, this is not my full-time job. I do work a 40 hour a week job during the, you know, during the week. And I do all of this in my spare time whenever I can, like after work, on the weekends. There's so much more that I want to do and the the time is coming where I just don't have the time to do it. So that's where Patreon comes in. Pledges start at $1 and go up to $10 a month with varying rewards like a behind the scenes Patreon feed of what projects and videos I'm currently working on, access to my Patreon only Discord server, early access to YouTube videos and bonus content like bloopers, quick tip videos, and even a monthly Patreon exclusive behind the scenes vlog, holy crap that is a very long sentence to say, of what I've been up to cosplay wise that month. And then I've got a lot of other fun stuff planned like patron shout outs and build spotlights. And then I've got some longer stretch goals like whenever we reach a hundred patrons, I will be able to start live streaming my cosplay building progress. But really at the end of the day, what I want this Patreon to be is to be a joint effort and a two way street. It's going to be like you're my board of directors and guiding me in what content to create. And if you are interested in joining me, you can click the link down in the description or go to patreon.com slash fault fox. I just want to continue making more and better content for you guys so that you can get out there and do what you love too. And please don't feel guilty if you cannot donate to Patreon. Again, just watching, sharing, subscribing, all that stuff is support and I see you and I appreciate you. Thanks for considering my Patreon and I will now get into the tutorial, which is why you're all here. <laughs> to start out with this Mandalorian helmet, I have my 3D file pulled up here in Kira. I'm using Galactic Armory's Mandalorian file, which I'll link down below for you guys if you wanna check that out. And because I print using a Creality CR10S, my print bed is large enough that I can fit and print an entire helmet in one go. And I go into further detail as to how I do that in these two videos, which I'll also link down below for you. But in short, what I'm doing here is increasing the scale of the helmet to 103% and that's because my husband wanted to be able to wear his glasses underneath the helmet. I hit slice at the bottom right of the program and see that my print time is a little bit higher than I would like. The reason for all of this is because support material is being generated underneath the dome of the helmet. This is again something that I explained in better detail in these videos here but you don't need the support material under most domed helmets. So what I'm gonna do is remove it using the block support function on the left side of Kira. It's the button second from the bottom and all we need to do here is click on that button and place a block under the dome of our helmet. From here I select the scaling tool which is second from the top on the left hand side of Kira and increase the scale of our block until it's covering up all of the red area underneath the dome of our helmet. Once I'm happy with the placement I then slice the file again and now that we've got our support block under that dome we can go into the preview tab in Kira and see that there is no longer any support material being generated under the dome which removes a good chunk of print time as well as material cost from our overall printing estimates. All right with all of our computer 3d printing stuff out of the way it's time to load up the file on our printer and let it go for a few Days. Thankfully, mine printed out fine on this go around, but if yours fails, don't be too hard on yourself. I had multiple failures on this helmet that caused me to push this entire build to the side for about six months, so it happens to the best of us, and I am not the best of us. <laughs> Once the print finished, I removed all supports using a combination of my plastic clippers and some of these hook tools that I found at Harbor Freight. These are great for those tinier bits of support my clippers couldn't get into. After all the supports are removed, I take a wood burning tool and gently melt all of the remaining support parts on the helmet that are a bit rougher, kind of like like along the underside of the helmet where the raft attached on the bottom. Just be sure to wear a respirator whenever you're doing this, just to be safe. After all of the supports are removed, it's time to get to smoothing this print. Now for this specific build, as well as Bo-Katan, I use photopolymer resin, otherwise known as the resin that's used in 3D printers to smooth my pieces. However, I do find it necessary to let you guys know that I no longer use this method. I've linked a video
video down below going over my reasons that I'm no longer using it, but as a huge disclaimer to you guys, if you're going to be using photopolymer resins or any type of epoxy or resin to smooth your 3D prints, you absolutely must be using the appropriate PPE and safety tools for this method. This stuff is really no joke and it can cause an allergic reaction as well as any other type of epoxies if you get it on your skin. So it's best to be overly cautious when working with this type of resin. Make sure that you've got a respirator on with filters that are rated for chemical vapors at all times working with this stuff. You'll also want to be wearing nitrile gloves whenever you're working with this as well as goggles and work in a well-ventilated area where there are no pets, children's or others that are around who could be exposed to the fumes. I started off by making sure there was no ambient UV light around me while I was working as this could activate the resin as we're brushing it on. I then take a brush and start painting on a thin layer of resin all over the helmet. Do your best to not get too much resin into areas you want details to show through because once there's resin and it's cured in there, it's really hard to get out. I clean these spots out with a clean foam brush as I go to avoid it collecting in the detailed areas. You can also go in smaller sections with your resin and use a handheld UV light to cure it as you go. This allows for a better control of how thick your layers are, or you can do what I like to do and just paint on a whole layer of resin and place it out in the sun to cure for 15 minutes. Now I live in Pennsylvania where the sun shines pretty bright, but not hot. So I can get away with putting this stuff out in the sun to kind of cook and cure. But if you're in some place like you know, California or someplace that gets really, really hot and you're working with PLA, I would recommend making your own UV curing box so that you can do it inside in a more controlled environment and not worry about your PLA warping. After the 15 minutes is up, I then bring my helmet inside and spray it down with 91% isopropyl alcohol. This is cleaning off any residual resin that didn't cure due to oxidant inhibition, which I explained in this video here, and is removing the tackiness you might find when using this resin for the first time. I also use isopropyl alcohol to swish my brush in to clean the resin off between each layer of resin. Make sure to not take your brush outside with you whenever you are putting this thing to cure because it will cure the resin in your brush and your brush will be ruined. I totally did not do that. I repeat these steps a second and third time and after that third coat of resin it's looking like it's finally ready for some sanding. For me 120 grit sandpaper worked out the best to smooth this resin down evenly without leaving too many divots or scratches. You can feel free to experiment lower grits of sandpaper if you like but for me 120 is that sweet spot. I use my mouth sander and go to town all over this helmet until it's ready for some filler primer. I brush off any excess dust off of the helmet and spray on a thin coat of this two-in-one sandable filler primer and let that cure for about an hour. So after the filler is cured, I then go in with a quick pass of 150 grit on my mouth sander before moving inside to do some wet sanding. I start with 220 grit and work in small circles all around the helmet, re-wetting my sandpaper as needed or I need to clean it out. I then dried everything off with a towel and it was at this point that I noticed some heavier layer lines still showing along the top. So I let the helmet dry out and gave it another coat of two-in-one filler primer. Once that was dry, I gave it another pass of 100 150 grit on my mouth sander, a bit of hand sanding with a 220 grit sanding sponge, and then I went back inside for more wet sanding. I started again with 220 grit and worked my way up to 1000, working in small circles and keeping my print and sandpaper wet as I work. I'll occasionally run my fingers on the print as well, checking for any small scratches or bumps that I need to polish up with the sandpaper. Finally, when I was happy with it, I dried the helmet off with a towel and let it sit out in the sun to air dry a bit before it was finally time to start painting. When it comes to most chromes and some metallics like silver metallic paints, they tend to do really well with a glossy black undercoat underneath them. So to get that started, I'm gonna be spraying on a layer of Montana Gold Shock Black. Now I know what you're thinking, Montana Gold Shock Black is not a glossy paint. So why are you painting that on? Well, for me, it was a lot easier to control things like paint runs by painting on a flat black to the helmet first before going back in with my 2K clear coat to give it that glossy mirror-like finish. I go into more detail onto how I applied the 2K clear coat in this video here, but in short, I put on a respirator and gloves, made sure to wipe down any dust that was lingering on the helmet and began shaking my can of 2K clear coat for a good two minutes. Now 2K clear in a can is a two-part mixture that once activated and mixed together will have a shelf life of 48 hours. So I would recommend making sure you have as much of your armor or project completed and ready to be coated as possible so that you get the full benefit and usage from this can. This stuff ranges from 20 to 30 bucks depending on where you buy it so you really don't want to let any of that go to waste. Once that two minutes is up of me shaking the can the first time I then take the red stopper on the bottom of the can and use that to puncture and mix the two products into the can together to activate it. And I start by spraying on a thin coat onto my helmet in quick bursts from side to side. Once everything is completely covered, I let that first layer cure for five minutes before going back in again with a second coat, again a light coat, and I let that cure for another five minutes before giving it a final thick glossy wet coat and allowing that coat to cure for 72 hours. After a few days have passed and that 2K clear has cured, it's 
Finally time to chrome this dome, and for that I'm using my Iwata Revolution airbrush and some all clad chrome lacquer. I start by setting my airbrush compressor's PSI to around 15 to 20 and spray on a thin layer all around the helmet. Now you'll probably see here that I sprayed in small circular motions, but it's really better if you spray from side to side in quick bursts, kind of like how I sprayed on that 2K clear coat earlier. By doing it that way, you're going to avoid concentrating on one spot for too long or getting issues like spider webbing and accidental spurts of chrome through your airbrush. I ended up doing one coat of the chrome because I ended up really liking how much of the black was showing through and it kind of caused the color of the chrome to look a little bit darker, at least to me. Now for reference, I ended up using almost an entire four ounce bottle of the all clad chrome on the entire set of armor. That is not just the helmet, that is the entire set of armor. Once you're happy with the application of your chrome, make sure that you go and clean out your airbrush thoroughly and with the appropriate cleaning solution. All clad chrome is a lacquer paint and needs specific airbrush cleaner to properly break those lacquers down. If you don't clean it or you wait too long to do it, it will dry in there and it will brick your airbrush. I 100% did this with my Attack on Titan blades. Learn from my mistakes. Clean out your airbrush. With the chrome paint job finished, I let everything sit for a good 72 hours before applying All Clad's Glossy Clear Coat as my clear coat. This is kind of where things did not go right. I don't think I used this stuff correctly. We ended up with a couple of scratches on the helmet as well as some pieces of the armor. And I just, I, there was something, there was user error with this technique, but for full transparency, I'm gonna let you know what I did. I did two thin coats of this Glossy Clear on the helmet, letting the coats dry about 10 to 15 minutes in between each. Now, I only had about 24 hours to let this stuff cure before we flew to C2E2. So that might have played into how mediocre of a job it did protecting everything. But I also read and was told by a few people, which had apparently slipped my mind the day that I was working on this, I should have done a final thicker coat on top of those two thin coats to properly seal everything in. Now, if I were to do everything all again and I had more time whenever I was working on this before C2E2, I probably would have just gone ahead and used the 2K clear coat that I used underneath the chrome paint to seal in in the chrome. Whenever I was at C2E2, I actually got to talk to HDC Fabrication and I got to see his Mandalorian in person. And he actually told me that he used 2K clear coat to seal in everything and his looked phenomenal and I was sold on it. And I'm just mad that I didn't have the time to do it for my own helmet back here. So learn from my mistakes. And I would probably recommend going the 2K clear route for sealing in your chrome. So with the clear coat finally cured, it was time to install the visor. For the majority of helmets that I do on this channel, I just use these Cellstrom replacement visors for welders, which I'll link down below. I already have a visor template that I made out of cardstock, so I use that to trace onto the visor and cut it out with some tin snips. You can attach your visor into the inside of the helmet a whole plethora of ways. Like you could use hot glue, super glue, or even Velcro if you wanted to like take it in and out. But I personally like to use this two-part epoxy and place it into several contact points on the inside of the helmet. For better adhesion, you could even use some 80 grit sandpaper to roughen up the inside of your helmet. Now to avoid this helmet from being a complete bobblehead on my husband's head, I go and take some upholstery foam that I got from Joanne's, cut it into strips with a box cutter and hot glue it into the dome of the helmet. And to those of you that checked out my C2V2 prep vlogs, yes, this is where I burnt my hands. Don't try to catch hot glue. It's, it doesn't work. Once you've got all that upholstery foam in there, you can go back and kind of cut things down and adjust it more to your size head so that it gives you a nice snug fit. But with all that in place, the helmet is done and ready to wear. Thank you guys so much for your patience with this build as well as my Bo-Katan build because they were both basically my entire 2021 and I know that I'm only just getting into making these tutorials for 2022. So again, thank you so much for your patience. If you have any questions about the build or just anything in general, feel free to leave them down in the comments below. I'll be back next week with another Mandalorian tutorial for you all. And until then, I will catch you guys next time. Bye!